Richard. Hello everyone and welcome to this evening's event celebrating women in tech. My name is Sarah Tico, I'm the moderator for tonight and I'm joined by some really incredible women. Um, uh, just as a bit of an introduction, uh, I'm the founder of an organisation called Hatsumi. We're developing a VR tool that enables people to communicate lived experience of pain and emotions using 3D drawing in VR. I wear many hats, as I think many other people here do this evening. So I'm also the producer on a game called Explore Deep, a breath-controlled game designed to help people manage anxiety and um, the healthcare lead at Merced UK. So today is, uh, I guess, a very special day. It's uh, the celebration of Ada Lovelace, who was one of the really early founders uh, of modern computing and was one of the first people that really saw the role of computers beyond just making calculations and actually looking at how you could incorporate music and sound and images and storytelling into it as well. Um, I think now is a really important time to talk about the role of women in innovation, especially in the sort of post or current COVID age. Uh, we've seen a 1.8% uh, increase in women being vulnerable to job insecurity and about 75% of uh, all work is really unpaid. Uh, the, sorry, all work is unpaid? Uh, all unpaid work is done by women, and we see how these, this affects people uh, on quite a profound level. Um, there was a really interesting report that came out a few years ago uh, by uh, Liminar Immersive in collaboration with King's College London and uh, the University of Brighton that really looked at how the representation specifically of uh, women in immersive and they found that 14% of all UK based companies are led by women. So it seems like there's obviously quite an, a need to, to think about diversity in this sector, but also how uh, giving spaces for these women really enables new stories to be told, completely different projects and, and thinking about you know, what the future could look like uh, where everyone has a voice. Um, currently about 1% of all investment funding goes to women and even less goes to people of colour. So I think this evening we really want to talk about not just the role of women, but also thinking about how we bring in people of colour, neurodiversity, and thinking about how we make this an inclusive space for everyone. So without further ado, I would love to uh, introduce Rachel Henson, who's uh, another member of the Fusebox here. Uh, so Rachel is uh, an incredible artist and entrepreneur, and it's been such a pleasure seeing her work develop over the last few years. And uh, I'll leave, leave it over to you to explain some more. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> so I'm Rachel Henson, and I'm a artist, and I use photo sequences and moving image to make site-specific located experiences. I've been commissioned by festivals in the UK and abroad um, and for natural and heritage organisations like the National Trust and Discovering Places. My work is about how people inhabit or walk through a particular landscape. So how does the shape, the outlook, the nature of a place affect what people do there or how they travel through it? I find ways of lay layering an outdoor environment with what happened there in the recent past or what we imagine could have happened there. I ask people to view my work in the lo location it was filmed, usually in a way that involves their physicality. So for example, a series of photographic flick books shot from the point of view of a walker that you use to navigate your way through a, through a place, flicking pages to animate the sequence and following the story as you walk. Or a mutoscope install, installed in a location that's animated by turning a handle, which shows events that have happened there. This series uh, showed people playing and working in Tower, Ham Tower Hamlet Cemetery Park. And the latest idea is an optical de device that overlays the real world with a video of an event that happened in that place. So when you view life-sized moving image shot in a particular location in your dominant eye and look at the real world with your other eye, your brain combines the two views so that the characters and the action in the video appear to inhabit the real world. So a video of a tree blowing in the wind viewed through our dominant eye will make the same tree on a still day appear to blow in the wind. Um, and this works through binocular fusion, the way our brains combine different information coming into each eye. Um, and if you add a soundscape that merges with live ambient sound that is happening around you, the user gets this heightened awareness of their location. Um, and I call this the quizzer, 
which is after a single lens held up to the eye to peer through, which was popular with 18th century dandies. So our testers reported feeling super aware of their environment and invested in the story because they were able to control the action by scrubbing through it on a touch screen. So you can scroll forwards and backwards. So my journey over the last 10 years has coincided with smartphones becoming much better at location and navigation and the development of augmented reality on smartphones and with headsets. But I haven't yet used AR headsets for my work because they block out your peripheral vision and they have a small field of view which doesn't work when you're looking at a wide landscape. And AR on small screens suspends our sense of where we are which sort of destroys the very quality of attention that makes an outdoor location immersive. This is where the quizzer might come in as a low-tech yet immersive way of viewing AR. So at each stage of my work, um, it's all, all been about inventing ways of layering reality without distracting from your surroundings. And it's been difficult to describe. It's, uh, I'm often a beginner. Um, and I always ask myself, does it, does it really work? Um, so I want to tell you a story. When I was about seven, I had a dream about a chocolate carrot. In the dream, I hollowed out a raw carrot and I filled it with chocolate and it was delicious. The next day, I asked my mum for a carrot and I dug the insides out, which was quite difficult. Um, I melted the chocolate and I poured it in, but it was not delicious at all. It was horrible. Um, and I was really disappointed and scornful at myself for imagining that it could ever taste any good. But even so, I've continued to have ideas. Um, and these have, and I, you know, I've been quite stubborn in pursuing them while constantly questioning whether they'll turn out to be only delicious in dream world, like my chocolate carrot. So ideas can be difficult to explain. And in order to get the money, get the opportunity to show the work, there's a lot of describing and explaining and persuasion involved. And often long before you've actually got very far into making the idea real. And this is a terrible burden for me because explaining things that are not yet in existence feeds directly into chocolate carrot syndrome. I find my ears, my, my, my ears, my ideas very hard to explain because they have a virtual aspect and a real world aspect. And often they don't have an easy frame of reference. Um, so you could call it augmented, augmented reality, but it doesn't work in quite the same way as people are used to AR working, which can cause confusion. So I'm often a beginner at the start of a new project. I have a background in languages, performance and event production. But for the last 10 years, for the whole of the time I've been a visual artist, I've been looking after a child under 10. Um, I had two kids six years apart, which has extended that period. And um, fitting paid work time around that leaves very little free time for learning and uh, experimenting without earning. But I did manage to learn a lot from scratch. So I learned digital photography, photo animation, how to make a digital image look good on paper, which is harder than it sounds. Um, how to make and bind flick books, making mutoscopes and filmmaking. But the quizzer is a completely different kettle of fish. It, it involves optics, product design and software design. And that's before I, make, I even get to make the content. So for, this, for some of the time, I've had the help of my partner, Neil Manuel, who's a software developer. And in fact, he's the ideal work partner, someone who is into the idea as much as I am, who's happy to tinker away on it in, uh, when he has the time and to have a stake in the final product. But as time went on, this became unsustainable with children. It, you know, we can take turns looking after them, but that means we seldom have any time to work together. So it's been tricky time-wise and financially. So my question has been, do I do something slower learning as I go, or do I invest the time raising money to pay other people who already have the skills that I need? And with, this, with the quizzer, I've done both of these things. So when I have raised money to pay someone, it's often not qu for quite long enough, and sometimes it's tricky finding the right people anyway, because it, it takes time to find out what skill areas I actually need someone for. Um, and 
to learn to speak the languages of software developers or product designers or optical engineers. Um, I didn't go to art, co art college, so I'm a self-taught art speaker. Um, I've tried to prototype as cheaply as possible um, so that by the time I need an expert, I'm clear about what I need from that person. The development of the quizzer has been a series of iterations that have happened over five years in between other projects. So I've, I first got the idea by looking through a camera viewfinder during a residency at Blast Theory. That was in December 2015. And then in April 2016, I spent a couple of days with the designer in Utrecht who had made similar things, um, who made a device with a prism and an Arduino. Then in July 2017, a whole year later, we made our own cardboard version with a phone at a residency at Lighthouse, which then led to my Fusebox residency in 2018, which was funded at first by an artist network bursary. So Fusebox has been a place where I've had various breakthroughs and advice, and where last year I worked on a redesign with J Alvarez, who is speaking tonight, um, funded by a Developing Your Creative Practice grant. But it's only now that I'm in a position to consult an optical design company, which will be expensive, but they will be able to tell me how I can improve on and what the optical limination, um, limitations are of the design that I have already. And after all this time, I still can't quite shake my chocolate carrot syndrome. I love the quizzer and it works magically for me and we've tested it and got some great feedback. But I find it hard to keep believing in this reality. I'm very open to other people's realities so that when the quizzer does not work for someone um, and sometimes it completely doesn't work, um, I doubt that it works at all. And this is a bit of a handicap. During lockdown, I had no time to carry on with the design of the quizzer itself as I was homeschooling and learning all the common bird songs with my daughter um, and I had a translation deadline. But I, it did provide a couple of really good ideas uh, for experiences that could be viewed through the quizzer. One of these is called a good use of public space and it's about that brief vision that we had during lockdown of how our local environment could be. Um, a way of, of seeing the past and the present and possibly the future use of a place, all at the same time. Um, and there's a difficult to pronounce word for it, which is palimps, palimpsest. There, I did it. Um, so the limitation of walking in places we could reach on foot during lockdown meant that we found new paths and places in our local landscapes. Um, for us, on the north edge of Brighton, Hollingborough Hill and the golf course was free of golfers. Um, there was an exponential rise in the number of people walking and playing there. So I counted um, more than 100 people an hour up there at many different times of day. You could linger on the hill while, rather than walk um, on the set paths. Um, kin, kids inhabited the woods and the golf hills and different views became available to us. I took photos and I fil filmed several families in their new favourite places on the golf course. But when lockdown eased, allowing the golf courses to open, it was quite shocking to us to lose this space. Um, and a quiet war began between the new golf, golf club management as they tried to corral us to using set paths. There was some direct action and new signposts were taken down in the night. Paths were blocked by the golf club. Paths that had been blocked by the golf club, they were dug out again and young people continued to gather regardless. Um, and I'm just going to show a sketch I've made. It's an impression of how a film viewed on the golf course through the quizzer could feel. Um, and now I just need the time to finish it. Thanks.
Oh, I love this fade in. Um, cool. Thank you so much, Rachel. I think it's such a just fascinating project, and I think it's so rare to see people that are actually working at the intersection of software development, but also looking at how you can develop technology and, and, and space it in, in fascinating environments as well. Um, and also, I think it's so important to hear about like actually what it's like working as an artist uh, and parent during lockdown, uh, or anyway, and this constant juggling of how do you balance life and children and surviving with actually making the things that you want to do as well. Um, and up next, we have the incredible Iona Scott, uh, also known as Plankton World. She is, again, uh, another incredible resident here at the Fusebox uh, and has a really incredible career working uh, across immersive experiences, stereoscopic 3D animation and animation, looking at the submarine microscopic world of plankton. So on my left is actually one of her um, amazing uh, installations as well, Disco Sphera, which has also been included in a number of commissions uh, at Micropia uh, Artist Amsterdam Royal Zoo and the Amsterdam Light Festival. So, without any further ado, over to you. Hi, uh, my name is Iona Scott. Um, I'm very grateful to be here and talk about my work because I think it's actually a really brilliant opportunity to look back at, at where I've come from and all that I've been through in my career so far. Uh, thanks, Rachel. I really enjoyed your talk. And I live in Hollingbury, so I didn't know that all about the golf course. So, yeah, definitely, um, I, I saw all the funny bits and pieces, you know, going on, but I didn't realise that. Anyway, I, I'm going to get involved in trying to stop the golfers. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, uh, back to me. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to do like an overview of my where I started out and some of the difficulties that I came across in my career so far so um, if you look at the picture on the left you can see that this is me when I was 18 um, and I did a, I left school at 16 and I did a BTEC in general art and design and um, so at the end my final project was a room size installation with lots of really really bright colors and I just had this vision of intense colors and kind of like installations in outside with just really, really intense colors. And um, my sort of inspiration was masks and um, yeah, faces. Um, so yeah, so that was my, when I was 18, I did my BTEC and then I went straight to art school and it was not really what I expected. Um, I didn't really fit in. I ended up on a sculpture degree and um, they weren't really sure what to do with me because I'd kind of come from a slightly, I was, my work was quite theatrical and um, the fine art and theatrical kind of disciplines don't really see eye to eye. So after about the first year, this is me um, in my studio space and they'd said to me that my work was very superficial and um, so they didn't really understand because a lot of my work was about the kind of membrane between our world and another world and I, that really fascinated me and it was very colourful and ethereal. And so, you know, that was really upsetting. I went, I went, I remember it was the summer, I went back home and I thought, I'm never gonna do anything again. I'm gonna be really serious, no colour. And um, by the end of the summer, I just came back and thought, do you know what? I'm just gonna like do it a thousand times more because um, I've actually got nothing to lose. So I, I painted my space blue and I started experimenting with lots of materials and, um, trying to fill a space in a different way than like a sculpture on the floor. I, like, I kind of like, I see the whole space together rather than, you know, just one part of it or necessarily just the sculpture. So it was kind of a sort of meeting of two worlds together already. I was really interested. And also the, the head of um, sculpture was an avid scuba diver and he um, did amazing uh, slideshows of underwater worlds and I was just like I saw the underwater worlds and I just thought wow I just love that I want to live there um, you know the bright colors and the shapes and it just was they're so succulent and vivid colors um, but little did I know that when you actually go diving you don't actually it doesn't actually look like that you have to get a very bright light and get very close up to actually reproduce um, how how these things look so but anyway, for me, I, um, yeah, I just started experimenting with materials. And then I got to another point where 
um, I was looking at a book about the Great Barrier Reef, and in the book uh, was, um, I found a picture of a, a microscopic plankton and a lobster. And I said to my friend Lisa, which one shall I make into a sculpture? Uh, randomly like that. She said, well, I think the, the plankton looks good. So, okay, that's a good idea. I'll make the plankton. So I, I set about making a giant six foot uh, representation of a plankton made out of fiberglass and metal, welded metal. And uh, fiberglass was pretty horrible, but I wanted this kind of translucent quality that that um, underwater creatures have. That are, it's sort of you know very delicate. Um, but the only thing you could I could find really was fiberglass, which is really toxic. But um, nevertheless, I this was my degree show at Norwich School of Art. Um, interestingly, I mean I was really happy with it, and I had my masks and. Um, yeah, and it summed everything up for me, but um, I was kind of disappointed because they, they still didn't really understand what I was doing. I mean, it was a very traditional art school, and they ended up, they screened off my work and they said it would be a distraction to everybody, and they gave me a third. So um, I suppose in a way I shouldn't have been surprised because I knew that they didn't understand what I was doing, and I'd already realised that if I did the work, they couldn't fail me. So, um, so anyway... I ended up going back to London, which is where I'm from, and um, I met um, some amazing people who were running a company making holographic clothes for bands. Um, this I've listed some of the uh, bands that um, they made clothes for. The Shaman, Adamski, Future Sound of London, Bjork, um, Orbital, um, Mixed Master Morris. Uh, so I kind of became involved in this music scene with um, loads of creative people putting on events and um, contributing. We all contributed things together, so it was like a collective. And um, so, so Richard was, he was the keyboard player in The Shaman, and um, so he was really influential and really encouraging. I mean, they were all really encouraging of my work. They loved my plankton sculpture, and they totally got my work. So that was really, really amazing. So I started hiring out my sculptures to clubs, and raves and videos. Um, I got involved with these um, sound systems, Spiral Tribe, Sugar Lump, DIY, Arda. These are all in London. Um, I showed my work at the Ministry of Sound, the Roundhouse, um, Cool Tan, Diorama Gallery. So basically, I thought this is great. You know, it's like it really. My sculpture just fits really well in. You know, and people are just really enthusiastic about me bringing it along. I even had a friend who'd ring me up and go, "There's a spiral drive rave. Let's put your sculpture in the back of the Renault Five, and we're going to drive it over and hang it up." So, you know, it was kind of this spirit of adventure. You know, and and yeah, it was important. It was important what we were doing. We were part of a movement, and you know, it was. We were. We were had power. We were. You know. I mean, there was a lot of you know, crazy stuff, as you probably know, with the raves and going out into the countryside and coming up against police and not being allowed to do events. So, but it was a, a very, yeah, it was a, an amazing time. So I'm really pleased to have got involved with that. Um, this was, I hired it out to videos as well. Um, Joe Negro Love Fantasy is on YouTube with a woman dancing around it. I'm actually over the woman dancing around it at the moment, but, um, and another one, Dream Frequency as well. Oh, there we go, gone away. Um, and I, um, I got a, an article in ID magazine. Um, as you can see, it says I was a blow, blow up sculptor. So the idea was blowing up very, very small things and making them very, very large. Um, and the same things that I'm still talking about now, which is bringing lots of elements together and um, trying to recreate this underwater world but on a large scale so that people can connect with it. Um, so this is another idea I had. Uh, I was obviously a bit of a fan of Pink Floyd um, and I, I grew up in Vauxhall just around the corner from Battersea Power Station and so one day I went round there and asked um, a guy with the crane if he could hold up my sculpture. Um, it's not on the top of it, it's actually if you look down just a bit below there's a tiny sculpture hanging off a crane. Um, and I went over the river and took loads of photos. And then, yeah, I basically, I ended up going to collect it on a boat. And um, some of the trumpets fell into the Thames, which was also like, wow, this is, you know, how, what, how could have that, I planned it, you know, it was like this kind of installation, but 
Yeah, it sort of it, it got even more interesting than I imagined. So um, yeah, just more. I just really wanted to get my artwork out into the world, and I, I'm, I'm not really a believer in galleries necessarily. I kind of like work and art that's out in the world and in unconventional situations. I think art should be for everyone. Um, I don't like this the middle person judging my work. I like I like to just show it and. Put it in unusual locations, I think. So, um, yeah, this is Fraser Clark, who was started Megatropolis at Heaven, and that was at Cool Town Gallery, which is in uh, Brixton. Um, then I went to San Francisco because Richard um, moved over there, and I went to stay with him. He invited me over there. And um, I made another version, two other versions of my sculpture, um, and exhibited a lot over there and got involved in you know, all the music stuff that was going on there. And I had a friend who had a record shop. So um, we, and well, those things called records. And, um, you know, yeah, so that was a really amazing experience to be over in San Francisco with all these English people and the whole kind of scene that was going on there. And then I found where I was staying, I found a book called Art Forms in Nature. And this is a book of um, engravings of microscopic plants from the 1900s. And um, the, ma the man, I think his name's Ernst Heichel, he was a scientist, but he did all these amazing engravings because he, he, it was royalty free, he made it royalty free. And um, he believed that everyone should see how amazing these creatures are. So I got really inspired and I started with an airbrush making huge paintings and someone said to me, have you thought about 3D animation? Because this, you could actually make these in, in 3D. Um, and I thought, wow, that's, what a brilliant idea. So I came back to the UK. I did a documentary making course. Um, meanwhile, I made a documentary about Andrew Logan and I started playing around with compositing, with um, putting his sculpture on the plinth and in Trafalgar Square. And um, yeah, so I started thinking, yeah, this is, I really like, you know, this medium, um, but eventually I found an MA in computer animation and special effects. And uh, in a year, I learned a lot about animation and special effects. And uh, my final project was about plankton coming to our world. And here's Bassy Power again, about Power Station again. Um, so yeah, quite a lot of me sort of playing around with, the, with this sculpture and how it relates to us and it coming to visit us. And then after this, I, I met a scientist at the Natural History Museum and I learned so much more about the importance of plankton and how they give up you know, half the oxygen on the planet and, and not a lot of people know that. Um, they uh, look incredible and they're very, very important for our survival. And so that kind of piqued my imagination and I just thought, wow, they just look incredible and they're really important. And I just, I really wanted to just recreate them as, in a large scale so that people could see them and start to learn more about them and all the different types of plankton. So I got a, a placement at a, a place called Lost in Space who did animation. And I worked with Jeremy Young, a scientist at the Natural History Museum. And I started to model some of these um, creatures. I mean, he calls them beasts, so yeah. Um, and then after that, I, was, I got a job in a, a games company and I was doing textures. And, um, but then I realized that actually, if I'm really gonna do this, I have to, I have to actually just make the animation myself and um, I have to make a demo animation. I had left my job, which was, it was a big risk because you know, it, was, it was a good job and uh, it felt really crazy to do it. But I just, this is what I wanted to do. And if I didn't do it, it wasn't gonna happen. So. I, I put all my skills together and I made a demo animation, um, Plankton World, and um, I approached lots of different people. I had to write a lot about, about it and explain it, like, like Rachel was saying, you know, there's a lot of explanation um, to get clear about what I was doing and why I was doing it and why it's important. And um, um, on the back of that, I got a commission at Kew Gardens and they, Pete Morris in the marine display just said, yeah, brilliant. I mean, he said, I'll come around and see your work. And he didn't actually turn up. And I was like, well, no, of course he wouldn't turn up. And then he said, oh, I just got lost. Um, so, yeah, I was, I couldn't believe that, that, you know, he really saw my vision. And I'm just so grateful that he did and that he believed in me at that point. And, um, 
he gave me like five pictures of different types of plankton and um, at the same time I'd met a company called Inition and they were just starting, they were doing stereoscopic 3D stuff and I just thought, you know, my whole idea was about, and my vision was about a ma making immersive um, environments so that to try and get this idea that we could actually go there. Um, and it's not about your head, it's not about thinking about it, it's about the experience, your senses, about feeling that you're actually next to these creatures. Um, and so, yeah, it's interesting that, well, Anishin really helped me to do the 3D aspect, so I made a three minute animation. And um, yeah, it was, it was very interesting that I thought, well, everyone's going to want to do this, but it actually seemed that people weren't quite ready to do something quite so radical as, as an immersive display. Um, because a lot of museums quite like the explanations. And so, yeah. But nevertheless, this was there for 13 years um, under the Palm House. And um, I toured it on a 3D TV as well. Um, at the same time, I made an anglerfish sculpture for Greenpeace at Glastonbury to represent the Oceans campaign. And I'd always done a lot of willow sculptures and I made a shark for the aquarium. It's actually a smiley shark. It's mouth's meant to go downwards, but um, yeah. And I always think it's sort of interesting because every, every sculpture has a story. I like the shark, I took it there, I gave it to them and they damaged it and they wouldn't pay me until I fixed it. So I learned when you make something, you've got to get it signed off. Otherwise, you know, that can happen. Um, this was in 2016. I was shortlisted for um, Wildlife Artist of the Year with my plankton sculpture. They just made a, a new category. Um, and this is um, once I found the fuse box, I moved to Brighton and um, yeah, I started experimenting with VR and I made an app called Shrunk. And um, yeah, I just, I took it to Brighton Science Festival probably about five, five years of running and Brighton Digital Festival was really supportive, um, the old market, and yeah, kids were really into it, and this, it, the app kind of mixed the sort of experiential way of being in that world, but also there was a voiceover of an explanation. I wrote my son into doing voiceover, so there was, there was a mixture. You could like just have the experience, or you could also get the explanation. So I think VR is really, really incredible in that way that you can combine those two different things. But I think the limitation for my work is that because I show it in museums quite often and to a lot of people, VR doesn't always work in that environment. But it was, you know, it's amazing to, whoops, I've gone too far. Uh, it was amazing anyway to, you know, to, do, to make an app. Um, and this is at Fusebox. Um, when I came to the Fuse Box, I was just like, this is just what I've been searching for all along is a community of, of artists and, and techie people and all sorts of different people, you know. Um, uh, I just, yeah, wow, because being from London, you feel like a bit of a minority. It's very businesslike, um, but Brighton, you just, there's, there's so many artists here that it's just perfect. I love it. So here's... Um, so my, my light, I've still been, I've still, I mean, I've had it registered as a design for 20 years. So this is how long it has taken me to make it into a light. And here I had a lot of breakthroughs with it. And MathJ helped me um, so much with 3D printing because I had this idea, I had a dream actually about, oh, I've got to try 3D printing again. And, and she helped me, we did it together. We got Blender and we, we, try, we cobbled together a, a, a prototype and my friend Sean helped me with the lights. Um, so yeah, that was just so exciting. You can imagine how exciting after so long um, to have this breakthrough. And you know, just really recently, yeah, um, amazing. And this, this, the other project here with the red spiky uh, radial area is with uh, Rachel. And that also is really exciting, this kind of, overlaying plankton in the environment as well because it, it sort of harks back to the themes that I was already doing in the real world. So yeah, that was really exciting. And Michael Danks helped me with 360 video um, filming because I've got another idea that I want to use that for. So here's my Discosphera sculpture um, in its latest um, incarnation. Um, and I met uh, someone else, an engineer, Sam, who helped me to perfect the design and it's printed out of recycled plastic. And um, so, yeah, I started to be able to make more of them. 
And then I went to visit Micropia in Amsterdam last year, having emailed them for about four years. Um, and they loved my sculpture and they said, uh, would love to commission two more. So basically um, last year I had this exhibition at the Amsterdam Festival of Light. And um, yeah, that was really exciting as well to have my work in the right environment so that you can see the context of my work. It's, it, it worked you know, well in different environments, but I'm kind of really enjoying it finding its place and um, it being relevant and the being, you know, the right conditions for it so that people understand the relevance of it. So, yeah, um, this is um, XR. I went to London to get involved in the, um, the march, the Extinction Rebellion march um, about extinction. It was quite funny because there was a lot of skeletons and mine is actually a skeleton, but no one really knew what it was. So I have to do quite a lot of explaining. Um, but yeah, so, and then this is, um, this summer I was uh, on a lab at the Old Market, um, a funded lab, to learn about projection mapping, and they lent us something called an LF2, which is a, um, it's a scanner and a projector in one unit, and it makes projection map mapping a lot more easier than it has been before. So you have the sort of software, and then you've got the, the hardware that goes along with it. So. I just had so much fun experimenting and mixing projections with my sculptures, which for me is like really the next step. I mean, I'd always thought about doing projections, but um, it just seems like combining them together seems to work really well for me um, and on a large scale as well. So, yeah, um, this is I just want to talk a bit about the, my family because they're, they've been really, really inspiring and, and supportive. My mum is a weaver and my stepfather is a painter and my dad is a surveyor. So they all like very, very encouraging of me um, expressing myself and, you know, doing, doing what I really love to do. So yeah, they've just been a really big part of, of supporting me. So um, this is me at Burning Man Festival. I think this sums up quite a lot of things for me in a way, being a mother, um, kind of, yeah, kind of really going for it. And I, I think quite often I set myself challenges and I really rise to the challenge. Um, I, because I, when I lived in America, I didn't make it to Burning Man Festival and I really wanted to go. So um, I just, I took my son, um, I bought a ticket and then I thought, oh no, I'm going to sell it. And then I couldn't sell it. And then I decided, oh, I'm just going to go. And everyone was saying, you don't know anyone. Why are you going? And it's like, well, I think it'll be all right. I'll just make friends. I mean, I've been to lots of festivals. Um, that's how it works. So, yeah, we totally winged it. We went in a Chevy Suburban. We slept in, slept in the back. We stayed there three days. He went up in a plane in dust storms. Um, yeah, it was it was an amazing adventure. And I kind of felt really, yeah, proud that I managed to... I'm, I'm just proud that I managed to do it. I managed to actually rise to the challenge. I push myself, you know, I don't go, oh, no, I, I can't do that. No, no, I, you know, I'm like, no, let's do it. Let's just... Let's just do it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think my work has definitely, um, I've learned a lot about myself through my work. I've learned that I'm resilient, determined, that I don't give up. Um, I've learned to laugh at myself, to have a sense of humor. I think I've learned that actually when things, you know, don't go so well, it's sometimes, although it's difficult at first, it something brings something out of me it makes me stronger and makes me want to do it more um and yeah the older i've got the more i've thought i just don't really care i'm just going to do it anyway i i think just doing it anyway has always worked really well for me um not everyone's going to like what you do but you know you've just got to do it anyway and um i tend to see things as you know i have a superpower and my superpower is i'm a woman i'm a mother i'm creative um, you know, I, I follow what makes me happy, I please myself, um, yeah, and I think, I think we all, as women, as people, I think I try not to look at the separateness of us and more the similarities and how we can join together and we can work together and, you know, what, what makes us similar rather than different. Um, and I try also, I've, I try to look at myself and my beliefs and what is it in me that holds me back? not necessarily anything outside of me, because I think that's the point of power is in ourselves. 
is how we can change things in the way that we we want them to be. We need to be the change that we see in the world. And um, you know, I've I've done things like you know I've learned that yoga really helps me. Aerial acrobatics really helps me. Um, there's, there's lots of things. Um, meditation is a great thing. I think it's all about finding what makes you happy. I think it I think it's really important that we're happy. That we think of uplifting things and we uplift each other. And um, you know, we are generations of women following emancipated women. It's not easy. It, we're going to struggle. Um, we're going to have to break through the glass ceilings. You know, we're going to have to change things. And I think, I think we really just need to join together. And more and more in COVID as well, I think we really need to realise that it's the power of the people coming together and and our networks and our way of doing things. Um, so. If anyone is interested in collaborating or doing events together and, um, you know, about oceans or the environment or, you know, kind of getting out direct action, doing stuff, doing art. Um, yeah, I think I think we just need to keep making things happen. And um, yeah, that's that's the end for me. So thank you so much for listening. Um, it's been really great to talk to you today and um, so great at the fuse box. It's just, I love it here. So thank you so much. <laughs> We're all silently cheering in the studio. Um, oh my goodness, like, amen to all of that. I think it's um, like events like this are so fascinating because I think, you know, we all work in the same co working space but it's always little glimpses that you have into people's lives whilst you're making a coffee or having a chat and actually being able to hear the whole story of, of uh, what someone's been doing and actually just that, that process is so important and powerful as well. And I think just saying, screw it, I'm going to do it anyway, I think is probably a common theme that we have uh, and will continue to find throughout the evening as well. Um, if you do have any questions, then uh, please feel free to put it in the YouTube live chat and we'll be uh, answering those in the Q&A later on as well. Uh, and those with or without a VR headset, then you can also join the conversation in Mozilla Hubs where uh, Grace and Laura from Incubit will also be in there chatting to people as well. Um, but onto our, our final speaker, last but definitely uh, not least, is Mafje Alvarez. Uh, she is an incredible artist that I have known for quite a few years now and actually really met her at the beginning of my journey into to VR about four or five years ago. Um, I'm losing track of time. Um, but she is the founder, well, part of, there is no founder in this collective. Our MAFJ is a part of a really incredible new initiative called Incubit, a female-led uh, UK-based creative collective, collective who nurture and develop early stage projects using VR and AR. Incubit playfully researches new immersive technologies and creates tools to help people, uh, individuals and organisations in underrepresented, underrepresented groups tell stories from the messy edge. Tonight she's going to be talking about Holon Space, uh, a multiplayer content creation tool that encourages creative expression. Over to you, Matt Jay. Hello. Uh, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been great to listen to Iona and Rachel talk. Um, I just realised how much I missed um, Fusebox and th how this became my family, uh, a place of belonging um, in the last few years and how weird it is to be um, here in, in COVID times, just feeling separated from that and kind of watching the world out of my kitchen window. Um, but yeah, I've been a resident here for since I think 2017 and um, today I'm going to be talking about Incubit. So this is a new um, collective and endeavour to bring together um, some of the people that Iona was talking about there. Um, other creative people who maybe struggle a little bit with getting into virtual and immersive technology um, and especially holding um, a few people together who maybe needed the opportunity as well. I'm um, just thinking about Emily and Grace and Laura and myself just following that energy that we had to create something together um, and to see where we could take it. Uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about um, some of the things that I've been doing and my background, but mainly I want to talk about this new uh, product that we've called Holland Space, which was what I spent last year experimenting with and um, bringing people into Fusebox and showing them what that was and just following the joy really and discovering that it's quite exciting to find something that people seem to enjoy and, and seeing where we can go with that. 
So, so this is me in alt space. Um, and given that we're in lockdown and uh, festivals aren't happening, I own a merch and Burning Man. <laughs> this was the alt space version of Burning Man. Uh, that to my, the person to my right, what I can see on the screen here is Andy Baker, who actually uh, wearing a unicorn horn on his head, he was the person that brought me uh, into VR, and I brought him into Fusebox, that's how that worked. Uh, he was busy hiding at home, uh, but we were both learning Unity uh, together. Um, and it's amazing being different avatars, so we have various different ones. This is the one in alt space, and we hung out together in Sansa. Um, we went to the Shangri-La Festival, and it's just been amazing. I learned about Burning Man through being in alt space. I never had the opportunity like you to go. So I learned about some of the, the, the values, the principles, and, and met people within that space. And that was a very interesting um, experience for me. So yeah, if you ever see me, that's what I look like in old space. Um, so I want to show, uh, tell you a bit a lot about my, my position in technology. Um, so my, my own journey began in 1995, I'd say, when I was at Art Foundation at West Thames College. Um, I took part in an initiative that everyone on the course was doing. It was, um, it was, it, it was to bury a time capsule uh, that was going to be opened in 2045. And the brief was to design or imagine something that would exist in 2045. And you can imagine that that's quite difficult if you don't know what, obviously you can't predict the future. So I started imagining, well, where, where are we now? And this was pre uh, internet. This was 1995. I think maybe the very first browsers were starting to kick off, or, or, but I'd never experienced the internet at all but until that point. And um, I, I terrified myself thinking about the future, thinking about the fact that if something could be possible, it probably would be done. I, uh, if you could clone a person, someone would be cloning a person. If nanotechnology uh, existed, it would be used, and it would be used to control us and manipulate us. I kind of look, started looking quite critically at advertising um, and how uh, the limbic system, um, so the, the sort of more ancient parts of our brain are, uh, that determine our drives. Um, so our desire to, to fight, our desire to reproduce, our feeding instincts um, and our like running away. These things um, relate to the limbic system. And so I was very concerned then that um, there was no ethics in technology, that if, if uh, somebody wanted to make you do something, they just had to manipulate you using whatever technology was available at that time, and that if it wasn't available, they were going to make it, and sci-fi films encouraged us to see visions like that. So um, it's very interesting that right this sec well, today, um, I find myself in the interesting position, an ambivalent position, of receiving the Oculus Quest 2, and not to be too political, but the fact that I have to log into Facebook with my actual name and my actual, I can only have one Facebook account and the only way to get into the Oculus Quest, which is the VR headset, is through this, is, is, is a very interesting situation that I'm in. So um, but I became very aware of how we're manipulated, let's put it that way. And my vision of the future was that if this technology is going to happen anyway, where do we stand with this? As a creative, I was very young at that point. I could I was thinking about going into fashion design and I realised that actually there was a lot of work to be done because somebody had to, not somebody, everybody, but a lot of people need to be there to decide where technology could be going and if we had an opportunity to, to help swing it in one direction or another, we could force it to go into some kind of good direction or be available at least to, to help channel it into some good direction. And in order for that to happen, we needed to be in the messy middle of it all. And I, call, I say the messy edge, but it's really it's the messy middle. You know, You have to be there where the change is happening. So I knew that that would be a very ugly place, but I was going to be determined to do that. So I wrote in the time capsule, this 2045 tin that went into the ground, I put my theory of what was going to be there in 2045. And um, I imagined something like brain control, um, something that you could absorb into your brain. It would, it would help you know instantly. And the closest we've got to that is um, kind of the internet right now, but I'm imagining in, we've still got 20, 25 years to go. Um, that will totally be uh, a reality that we're facing. We're already seeing some of the things that I imagined. And like I said, today is a very interesting day for the world of VR. Um, and, uh, and that's where that began. So I was determined to, to push myself into that space, even if it was really uncomfortable. And, and I've lived a very uncomfortable existence with technology ever since, I must say. Um, so yeah, like um, Rachel and Iona, I find myself in this 
also a strange position of being um, an artist, um, as I say, in this messy technology place. Um, also a mother, I have two children, they're both teenage boys, um, which for me was also another challenge. Um, and I'd say creative technologist because um, I've come to define that as my kind of main role here at Fusebox, where I work with um, artists who um, have come from similar kind of backgrounds to me in some ways through art school, but have um, continued to be artists and I've, I've ended up being more a technologist. Um, but I really am interested in helping them to overcome that little speed bump that they seem to sometimes be in, where they need to just have someone to believe in them, but also just technically help them to move to the next bit. And I'm really excited and so happy and proud to see how people that I've worked with have gone on to, to develop these amazing things and, and show them everywhere and everything. And there's a part of me that feels sad that I'm not showing my own work, but um, that time will come, right? Like, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm still, I've still got a little bit of time to go. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I, I ended up sort of splitting myself in two. On the one hand, I saw myself like an artist doing um, stuff around people and belief and it's doing little social experiments, I suppose, uh, in terms of art. And on, on the other hand, I became a, a user experience designer, a web designer, um, basically a graphic designer, just to, to make ends meet while I, while I was a mother. Um, and so I've focused on these three things commercially, and my work is very kind of tidy, quite precise, I'd say quite graphically um, tight, yeah, tidy, let's say, which is in stark contrast with the kind of experiments I do as an artist. Um, I, uh, I, well, you can read, <laughs> I specialise in user experience, interaction design, and now virtual reality, I've added that. Um, I do, as an artist, I do this sort of thing. I make games. I make games with people. And I'm, the reason that I like games is that you get an opportunity to play them, and no two games are ever the same. Everybody is so different, and I'm fascinated by how different everybody is, how everybody thinks differently, how everybody operates differently, and within a game, how you can take on roles and then behave differently. Um, the top left um, here, you've got a game called uh, Panopticon, which I developed um, at Lighthouse um, with uh, a, someone who was a resident there at the time called Chris Pynchon. And it's looking at data privacy and um, security and how our data makes its way out into the world, our images of ourselves and, and things like that, and about data guardians. Um, the image on the right is uh, the product of a game jam, looking at power and movement. What would happen if you had more money, less money, more power, more less power, more ability to move around or less? Um, and that was a board game. The, and on the left, um, long-term collaborator Tanya Maditsky um, and I, we developed a piece for the Lowry um, based on human connection and connecting things together. Uh, so it was, all the work is very interactive um, and that was soft sculpture. So again, I just love to watch what people would do with the work I made. That was very important that they interacted with it. Um, which takes us on to Root Beans, um, which has been a fascination for me and the main project since 2002, I'd say. Um, it came out of um, working in a bar. I worked in a bar called The Foundry in London, which was also an arts venue. And um, again, this, this relates to the choices that we make and how the, the consequences of the uh, choices that we make affect our lives. So every, every line that you make in this game um, leaves a trail. Uh, and so the, the, the piece on the right, which is um, an actual app that I developed when I did my master's in digital media art at university here in Brighton, um, looks at what people think is important. I asked the question, in 10 beans, what is important to you? Um, and so you can see that this person who named their beanbag Keep Calm and Carry On, thought that these things were important. And actually, that's one of the highest scoring beanbags in the whole game. And there's about 200 people who contributed to uh, this app. Um, so on to VR. So like I said, Andy Baker with the uh, unicorn horn there, he talked me into it. He roped me into it. He had a very clever technique <laughs> where he lent me a headset and he invited me around and he showed me what I could do with it. And he put... He, he put VR into the game I was making, um, which was called Lena Bellina. And on the left at the bottom here, you can see that I'd already started to create this character based on my mum's story. My mum had passed away and um, I was using VR and 
um, unity, game development, as a way of, exp of processing the grief, I think, of her passing, and as a way also of um, developing assets that would have a legacy, because I, I started to learn unity and I started to learn um, technical development in, in, for game engine unity just on my own, but following tutorials, I signed up to a few courses. And I got really annoyed that a lot of the content was very meaningless. It was a lot of robots, spaceships, bat, bat and ball games. And it, for me, it felt like if I was going to put that much effort and time into developing something, it might as well be something that I can have for the future. So um, I started my residency here at Fusebox, and you can see the top left there. Um, I developed the game um, called A House for a Fly, and it's, it's a kind of mini documentary slash experience slash game um, that you can, there's a YouTube video and I think probably the YouTube video will persist longer than any other VR or anything else. Um, but it looks at a story of my mother when she was a little girl, how she was trapped in a room, um, trapped, she was locked in the room by her mum for her safekeeping. Um, but all she had in that room was uh, a, her baby brother who was crying in a cot and, um, well crying, he was sleeping in a cot but if, she, if he woke up, then he would start crying, and that was going to be difficult for her. Um, but she found that there was a fly in the room with her, and she tried to become friends with the fly because she was very lonely, but, you know, she was kept there for her safekeeping because she was a very adventurous girl. So the, the story really goes about what happens when you, um, you feel lonely and trapped, um, but how, you know, she found a friend in the fly, which other people would just stick up fly paper and kill all the flies, but she, in that moment, that was her best friend for a little while. Um, so, yeah, that's how I got into VR, and now I've got a, a, a thing which is a legacy for me. Um, but here we come down to um, working with the community of women at Fusebox. Um, we, we became more numerous, um, and it was, it was wonderful to, to meet Rachel and Iona and, and all the other women here, and Sarah, of course. And we started to imagine what, we, what it could be like to work together, what we could do, and how we could help each other. Um, and at the time, I... I would take, I tended to um, overcome my own financial situation by doing um, contracts. So I'm a, a subcontractor, or sorry, a contractor um, for government um, design. So I work at the moment at HMRC, um, which might sound really boring, but for me, it's their puzzling challenges. And I really love helping people. And, and by working at HMRC, I can help millions of people to, um, to get a better experience um, online. So it's filling in forms, that, and I hate forms. They, they, they're things which bring me a lot of stress in my life so by helping um, the government to make forms easier I'm also making my own life easier and I hope um, other people's lives easier but the thing is that um, I needed time off so I would do a few months of contracting then I would take a few months off to be here at Fusebox uh, and that's when I began doing all this work and um, and so, yeah, I, I, people started coming to me as well and saying, can you help me with your project, um, and can, my, with my project? Can I? <laughs> and, um, and I started to try and bring my technical abilities to them in the form of 3D printing or a little bit of um, 3D modeling and um, using Blender and doing some VR experiments, and, uh, which takes us to um, what we're going to be talking about a little bit more and demoing to you, so there's going to be a video at the end here, which is Holland Space. So Holland Space is um, a, a tool of expression, um, which it, I found a technique um, to use within Unity to develop objects very, very quickly and allow um, collections to be made that then could be um, created into these kind of sculpture, montage, collages. And this is the, on the bottom left here is the work of Etienne Leconte, He's a, a local Brighton artist, and he was very generous and very kind. And we put together an event in GoVR, um, which has been a fantastic venue and very supportive of our work as well. Um, and we'll be showing you that in a minute. I'm going to rush through here. To test, to test uh, Holland Space, we actually created a, a game over a weekend hack in Brighton uh, called Power Babies. And this was really looking at how ridiculous some of our leaders are um, and how they seem to mud fling. Uh, and even more relevant now to the, if you're watching the news about how leaders are behaving, it seems to be more relevant. We couldn't put this on. It was going to be part of the Brighton Fringe Festival last year, but it had to be stopped because of COVID. Um, sorry, this year in May, um, we couldn't put it on, but we hopefully will be able to develop it a little bit further. Um, and uh, current, I'm currently working with an artist called Camille Baker, who um, was looking at... Uh, 
female reproductive system of premenopausal women and postmenopausal women, basically women in their middle age who start to have things go wrong with their bodies and how we perceive our own bodies. And being a woman of that age myself, I just started to discover in working with this project how I also have some things that are wrong with me. And, um, and actually tomorrow I'm going for an operation in this field. So it's, it's, it's been a, a ride, let's put it that way, to work it with, in projects with women who want to work with other women in, with ha with, that might have technical boundaries that we can sort of overcome together. And this has been a real interesting experience. So I was, I was helping to develop um, some graphic techniques using um, looking at the 3D-ness of our bodies. We're, our bodies are not like the one on the top right left there, which is a 2D flat image. We, our bodies are a lot more round than that. So actually going inside the body, how does that feel? What, does it, what is it like to go inside a, a uterus, uh, for instance? Um, and um, on to Incubit. Sorry, I've run out of time. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, but this is Incubit. So Incubit's a very new venture. It's a colla uh, collective. I am absolutely terrible at applying for funding. I, I, I have a phobia, it seems, about um, putting myself on paper. People who know me know that I can do things. People who don't know me uh, struggle with when I present myself in a form. Like I said, I don't like forms. Um, but it seems that people are willing to work with me um, to help to develop some of the ideas that I've got. But also, I really enjoy watching people grow and learn and be together. So. Um, Incubit is, is an attempt. Chris, do you mind moving it to the left because there's a, a diagram thing on the right? We, the, so this is the idea of the, the kind of companion planting of permaculture. So if, if that model that people can be so mutually supportive and actually create a much better ecosystem by being together and working together. Um, and, uh, and so I've come up with this term digital permaculture bit cheesy, but it's the idea that we can support each other and we can use what we have available. It might not be pretty, but it's going to work because we'll, we'll pull it together somehow. And it's embracing the mess a little bit as well of our lives, that we can be a little bit um, all over the place and we can bring our best feminine selves. Like, we, you know, we're not super polished all the time. Like, we don't have to be. It's OK. Um, but we can bring the most creative and fertile parts of ourselves to, to bear on our work. And I'm going to carry on with that kind of metaphor a little bit um, as well. So, um, finally, we have a video, and I hope this plays. Hi, um, we are the Incubit Collective, it, and, and we are here in Holland's place. I am Grace. Um, I am a producer, and my role is traditionally in film and television. Um, but I have recently come into the world of immersive and virtual reality, and uh, really interested in creating social spaces within uh, VR. Laura? Hi everyone, I'm Laura. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this female-led tech collective, Incubit. Um, I'm a business professional and a creative technologist. I'm really passionate about immersive tech and the opportunities that are arising because of it, um, especially being able to cross borders of space and time and meet up um, with people in virtual environments. Um, to be able to to create art to, together, and um, that's what we're doing here in Holland Space today. Um, we uh, we have a tool for creative expression, um, which showcases the artwork uh, of um, Brighton-based artists, uh, and uh, and from it we can create infinite um, iterations of the art itself. And here we have Emily. Oh, hi, I'm Emily. Um, I'm very new to the world of VR. I previously worked at Wired Sussex um, as a digital marketing manager and Wired Sussex from the Fusebox. So through the Fusebox, I met Math J, um, who in, um, introduced me to a new world of VR, really. Previously, I'd had a few experiences, but they were kind of uninspiring with no value. But what Math J showed me, Holland Space, um, Kind of completely changed my view on VR um, and its potential to elevate worlds and experiences. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to be part of this collective and uh, explore the possibilities of this vast medium. And so, if we just show you what we are doing here within Holland Space. We have a piece of work by a local Brighton artist called Danik Minotaur here. And what we've done is take elements from the artwork and created for Hollands, which are 
physical object created um there we go you can have a look at them so this is a spaceship and that is an element up there at the top uh, of that artwork and oh so I just did a little run around um and then what it means is that we can create new sculptures and work from existing pieces I was going to run around there we just love being able to see the artworks in a three-dimensional space and be able to play with them um, and explore all the different forms that they can they can offer I think one of the best things about Holland Space is the fact that um, you can get images really quickly um, into virtual reality make it by making them volumetric and um, create immediate, immediate value really or create a, a fast prototype in maybe less than a day um, with the artwork itself. And without having to code as well, I think the beauty of this is if you're an artist or creator, you're able to create a Holland, yeah. create an element of artwork without having to code. Um, amazing. I feel like, yeah, kind of like I talked about after your, your talk, I don't know, I think it's just, we've all existed in the same space for so long, but like, obviously when you're making a cup of coffee in the morning, it's never like, here's an introduction to my entire process in life. And so, yeah, it's just so fascinating hearing about all the different places that you've all come and all the journeys that you've had. I mean, I think it's really interesting seeing like the themes that emerge from just like being new to something and just being a complete beginner and how frightening that is and and sort of making that jump into trying something when mm -hmm. you have no idea what to do and especially when there are people telling you that you can't do it um i think is just like the hardest thing and i think one of the things that actually really resonated was what you were saying about how you were like people don't know where to put me mm -hmm. and i think this is like an experience that i've had for a really long time as well it's just like i don't want to be i want i want to be in loads of boxes mm -hmm. but like you know especially when you're at school and it's like when you grow up then you can be a nurse or mm -hmm. uh, a cleaner or an artist and it's just like well what do those things actually mean um but yeah, I think just like doing it anyway is, is such, a, such a bold thing to do. And I think there's all that thinking about it beforehand that's almost like the worst bit. And then saying like, okay, I'm gonna start this project and I'm gonna work with people and I'm gonna make it happen. Um, and also like the, the reality of it as well. I mean, like all of you are mothers as well. And I think juggling life with uh, having children and paying the bills and having to either apply for grant funding or looking at the world of investment and it often feels like the odds can be stacked against us even though when clearly you guys are all doing amazing things as well but i think like the the, the thing that i really like got from it at the end as well is you talking about collaboration i think in the world of like being an entrepreneur or wherever we fit ourselves in the artist entrepreneur spectrum then um i think there's always like this theme of like there's always it's like fighting rather than winning. And I think that, that your, your, what you were saying about um, 
sort of digital permaculture and the idea of working together and actually like maybe everyone can win mm. uh, by by doing things together as well because what, what happened I, and so I was really curious to ask at the beginning of lockdown because it's inky bit started during lockdown right it's just started two weeks ago actually in terms of actually beginning yeah. yeah. So what was the process that led to that? Because I know there's been lots of discussions and you've been working on Holon Space for a, a long time, yeah. but, but how did how this did collection of people um, come I think because after leaving the fuse box and, and lockdown everything, I suppose, you know, you, you're, at least it happened to me that my circle of like friends, my friendship group or the people that I was still in contact with became a little bit smaller. And it, it did become limited to like who could go on to Jackbox TV on a Saturday night. I think like, you know you were involved in some of that stuff. Um, I saw people that were more local to me, like in Brighton. So the people that lived um, more close to me. And um, it happened that um, Grace was living nearby, but then she was moving away. And we were always in those discussions around how how could we work together? How could we make something happen? And it just it was just the right time, the right moment. I mean, certain circumstances came together. They had seemed to need that kind of work. I seemed to have saved some money from um, eight, uh, my contracting work, and I'm like, well, if there's some money available, we can put it together, rather than just you know, be in this fearful mode of just save, 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 because you don't know when COVID's going to hit you and you're going to be unemployed or something like that. I was like that for a while. And then I thought, well, hang on a minute. It shouldn't have to be like that. Maybe this is the right time to invest in us all doing something more interesting and saying, I don't have time to do this. Maybe I can carry on working and make this possible um, financially. And I, I, I can't apply for grants, and they can. They're great at talking about stuff. I mean, they have skills that I don't have. And, and together, I think we're much, we could be much stronger. So it's only begun a couple of weeks ago. I wrote contracts, and uh, it, it's all become a sort of formal thing. But um, we're still a group of friends doing stuff together. And the idea is that we can then bring other people along in this collective. But first, we have to establish this uh, permaculture core. Mm -hmm. It feels like something where we can learn about working together as a kind of admin team, I suppose, to make it happen. But also everybody who's come together, including Emily, who's um, recently just left a marketing position here at White Sussex, um, was available and just, there was the right time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think together we can, we can take and do all these things and take the word out there and bring other creators. We need to get more creative technologists here um, to, to be helping other artists and working together. Yeah. Absolutely. And I guess that's perhaps one thing that has been useful out of lockdown is that perhaps some people have had more time, maybe some more than others, though. And so, like, I mean, what's the experience like the last few months been, been for you both? Like, have you had space to, to carry on working? Has it been a real juggle of, of different things? Or, or how has your work changed, I guess, during the um, time? Well, um, yeah, um, it, at, the be at the beginning, it was such a relief not to be have to be out in the world anymore. I really enjoyed that, um, and I loved homeschooling my daughter. Um, and so, and we did. I spent a lot more time outside um, in the country, or well, it's not the countryside, but uh, on the edge of the city, I suppose. And because my partner's at home, um, I was in fact given more freedom because I didn't have to be there for a pickup at three o'clock, which it always breaks up the day. So I had less time and more time, mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. yeah, and I could concentrate on the things that were really important, I think, yeah. Yeah, because I think what I think what's, what's been interesting is like the complete transformation of how people socialise as well. And whilst there's like perhaps less time for some things, there has been an interest in events moving online like this. Uh, but also, like you say, like things like Digital Burning Man or all these other things that have been happening. Yeah. Like, I mean, it was it was incredible. So I met Math J there, and I was like. <laughs> in my PJs, <laughs> like I was in my bed going to Burning Man and, and it was incredible and you know lots of these things I probably would have let pass me by anyway and none of these things would have happened actually yeah. if it wasn't for the last few months and, and you know like the VR isn't accessible for everyone and there are some times when you know other things work better than others but, but that was the closest thing to having that real experience and we were like trying to find each other and like what worlds are we in and how do we meet each other and you know that moment when you like have lost your your friend at a festival <laughs> or in fact you were just meeting your friend at some festival in digital yeah. space and then you see each other and it was just like this really yeah. beautiful moment of seeing you guys you and Grace there and being like oh my god yeah. and uh and just like dancing together remotely and uh and I think you know there's been such a, a lack of like that human interaction 
during during the last few months and I don't want to talk about the C word for too long but um, but I think it's really interesting seeing how we can play with these digital technologies to like facilitate connection when it's probably not always yeah possible. it's quite nice if you can't normally go to things isn't it like and um, being able to we did a lot of zoom parties and you know like once a week zoom party and you know yeah, it was. It, yeah, it was really entertaining for a while. It was you were able to go and socialise, but it was a bit odd with a screen because you end up being this certain persona, don't you, on a screen? You're mm -hmm. like, sometimes I just put my cat in front of the screen, and sometimes <laughs> I just, I didn't really want to be there. I don't know. I didn't really. It's, then you just end up looking at everybody who, and that look when they're not on the screen, and they're just like, you know, not noticing, and they're suddenly, oh my god, it's me now. I'm really, you know, going for it, and this. Yeah. Kind of yeah, it's a, well, it was, yeah, it was an interesting, an interesting time. Yeah, it becomes quite performative, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, and especially when you're doing it all day as well on mm. work calls, then mm. I think it's kind of hard sometimes to get into evening yeah. mode and being like, I'm still on Zoom. Yeah basically but it was kind of interesting so, so before this event began for everyone watching then uh, then we actually had like a little zimba warm-up which was quite fun <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah because we like film it, but <laughs> yeah it's a shame we didn't film it because it, it was really great um but because i think no matter how much like but at least I do public speaking I still get really really nervous but it was really nice like kind of having a little move beforehand and like one of the things that, that me and my friends did during lockdown is that yeah we started Zumba where yeah we did uh, an online Zumba class like every week or so and it was such a nice way of uh, being together with people and having like sort of an embodied collective experience where you don't have to be like how was your day same as yesterday <laughs> but actually like yeah finding different ways of being able to interact like using your body and not actually having to communicate in the in the same way as well um, I'm saying we're having a few comments from uh, YouTube by the way I do recommend if anyone has any questions to put it up there I'm trying to read what they're saying my eyesight is not what it was um, Excellent presentations. I need to leave now. Will these uh, discussions be available to watch later? Yes, they will, Helen. They will all be online. Uh, thanks to our uh, wonderful support, Chris, who is doing something. He's um, making the words bigger. He's making words bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Very inclusive here at Wide Sussex. Um, these are other words. Uh, I'd also love to meet people, particularly other women, doing this sort of thing and find out what the fuse bet box is. Where do I start? Helen, go to Wired Sussex website and uh, all the fuse box fusebox.brighton.com thanks chris uh, which is a really good place to start but there's also like loads of other resources available we are actually joined this evening by Rita Thorpe Tracy who's the new events manager <laughs> at Wired Sussex who also runs a really cool event here in Brighton called she says uh, and there's so many amazing communities like that around she says is a, an international uh, event that happens all over the world hence being international but i think there's also great things like women in games the knowledge transfer network do loads of good things about supporting women in uh, Immerse UK, we do lots of things there as well. Um, make Play Code, you know Make mm. Play Code? They're make really play good code, for yeah. a learning Unity and Scratch programming for women, so they're really, I think you have to follow them on Twitter, Make Play Code, yeah. Nice. Cause, um, so yeah, where do you go to, to learn new things? And how, because how, most of you guys are essentially self-taught, right? Mm. Like how did that process first begin, begin and, and yeah, what's it? God, it's really interesting, isn't it? I think there is a lot of, can I do this? Um, what does it take to do this? Um, and I think I've learned that actually being really determined, I have got that, I've just got to make this work. Determine, you've got yeah. to have determination. I think willingness to kind of realize that it doesn't just take the skills because there's YouTube clips, there's all sorts of training out there. It, it mostly is the determination, but I definitely, I'm definitely aware of this kind of um, superiority, inferiority feeling of not knowing something and can I make something any good? And also this invisibility, you see your skills, you don't really see them as skills. You kind of go, well, I don't really know what I'm doing, you know. I know a lot of different things, but not to the degree that maybe I'd like to. But I think that if you have a project or have a, um, something that motivates you, that is the way you go, right, okay, let's just narrow it down to what would I like to do? How would I like to do it? It's scary, but I'm going to have a go. But yeah, I think it is a really interesting area because it is really scary. And there's so many people going, let me help you and I can do it for you. And I'm, 
no, I don't want. I, I don't want someone to do it for me. I want to learn how to do it. Mm. I think yeah. that's it. You can feel really stupid very quickly when people ask you lots of questions that you just don't even understand. And yeah. you, if you're determined, that's I agree. It's that stubborn obstinacy, really, mm. to say you make me feel stupid. But you know what? I know I can do it because I've done it in the past. Mm -hmm. And no amount of you telling me I can't do it because I shouldn't bother. I'll do it for you. Is going to make it. That's an awful thing to tell people, isn't it? I'm going to do it for you. Let me do it for you. Mm. And then they bother yeah. off. <laughs> they yeah. leave you half done or something. It's it, well, like, it's an interesting what? line between collaborating as well, isn't it? Because it is that kind of um, respect. Yeah. It's like respecting where someone really seeing who you are and, and you know, respecting you. Yeah. Being able to go, Look, I, I see that you can do this. Yeah. You know, and I see your, the future of what I, your capabilities and I know you can do it rather than... There needs to be that respect, I think. Yeah, really. I'm not, we need to give it to each other. What, sorry, I interrupted you, Richard. Oh, no, I was just going to say that, though in my talk I said I, I really hated having to uh, describe and how difficult that was, mm -hmm. um, I think that's how I get, that's where I get my determination from. So I have an idea and I will describe it and I might get funding for it and I haven't made it and I don't have the skills, but I will, that will then be my deadline or my... Mm. I have to deliver this, mm. um, challenge, yeah. and and it and it will make me do it yeah. mm. in a way. Yeah. yeah, it's like having the obligation to, of the deadline or the exhibition, and that is the good thing. Having that, mm. like today was a, a deadline for Inky, but we'd only started two weeks ago. We weren't even <laughs> sure what it was exactly that we were going to do, but it's good to have a, some sort of deadline, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It brings brings yeah. stuff. So that's out. what university is good for too, actually. Yeah. Uh, if, if nothing else, just to give you deadlines. And I think we could do that to each other probably. Just yeah. give each other deadlines. Yeah, I think that's or, or the thing we talked like about that, last right? year, wasn't it? It was because. just like let's just do a stand up once a week and hold each other accountable. Because yeah. I think it's really hard I mean, when you. Yeah, we, mm. we should we should start that again. That's what I've. Um, that's what was in my head before this came up again. Yeah. I'm saying, can't we do that? Yeah, because I think mm. it's so hard doing things independently yeah. because it's very easy to go. Maybe I'll just start at noon today, or maybe I'll just prioritise the paid work yeah. and leave these things yeah, aside. Sure. And I know I'm guilty of that, like all the time. In fact, especially at the moment. And uh, and I think yeah, just having other people around to be like, how's it going? And just being able to talk it out with mm. as well. And I think that's that's something that I've really gotten out of being here or other like spaces like that, where it's just like, can I just like say the words because I don't know what the words are and, mm. and yeah I think like a lot of my interest is in using immersive technology uh, to help people describe experiences that, that they struggle to as well um, and yeah and I actually see that as again like a theme throughout us as well it's just like either like finding something like very niche like mm. plankton and being mm. like building this whole career out of it mm. um and it's such an, an infinitely fascinating mm. idea but also like looking at problems and and, and and things that haven't actually been addressed or that aren't really talked about in society very much like grief or the menopause or all these things that are often really overlooked and you know for me like the way that I started doing Hatsumi was uh, kind of through my own experiences of mental health and sitting in a doctor's office uh, being prescribed like heavy antipsychotics and just being like are you not listening to me like mm -hmm. I think I'm okay mm -hmm. uh, and, and being really interested in how immersive storytelling could be used as a, a tool to to kind of give insight into worlds where perhaps you don't have the words so using things like 3D drawing and sound but um, but I think that's what like mm -hmm. a really unique perspective that, that women can bring um, or just people that aren't cis white men, essentially. Because after a while, you do just start to see the themes and the things that are being created. And even when people talk about the games industry, they just assume it's like shoot 'em ups and and mm -hmm. you know all these quite you know aggressive, manly things. But actually, there's a whole world of collaborative games. And you know, I'm really fascinated in how games can be applied to you know other areas as well like healthcare and well-being but like you know there's so much more than that as well you alluded to this year being a bad year for you can you say something about that bad year well it's been it's been a mixed year for everyone hasn't it and um, What's happened this year? I think this year has been quite challenging because I, uh, I think I've stuck up for myself more than I have before. Yeah. Um, and there was yeah something that happened a while ago that was actually about like diversity in uh, in a documentary that was made, and I said you know I, I have an issue with this, and uh, and it was actually somebody that ended up sort of personally calling me out. 
uh, and trying to sort of sabotage a job I had essentially and I don't think I've quite experienced anything like that before but um, and it was a really really hard time like it makes me feel emotional even thinking about it but I think um, and just feeling really scared and alone and just not really knowing like how to respond and worrying that this would affect my job even though it was really something that I believed in um, but actually I ended up just reaching out to loads of like incredible people like both people here at the fuse box and some other like really impressive women in the space and I just said like this thing has happened to me and I'm terrified and I just don't know how to respond and actually like what came out of it was really great because I learned so much about how to have difficult discussions and also like really did not feel alone and I think like being a solo founder it can often feel that way uh, and actually as a result of that I ended up uh, getting asked to moder moderate a panel about sex and video games for the w women in games conference which is probably like almost as fun as this so I guess some things do come out of it and actually you know a bit like being stuck and, and learning something new like again dealing with uh, difficult situations like that and trying to put a positive spin on it even though it still makes me really sad to think about but actually like yeah really good things did come out of it as well as the kind of challenging bits as well so. it's very easy just to close down mm -hmm. when something happens like that and go and hide in a hole yeah you know. so well done Thanks. Yeah, brilliant. I think I think that idea of um, not showing vulnerability. Like I think we have a lot of pressure to not be vulnerable, to not appear vulnerable. And you you know you you seem very competent and very capable and very confident out there. But I know that it's difficult for you, and it, it's it's difficult for all of us. But that kind of vulnerability, I think it we, it can be a strength, right? If we can push through that, mm -hmm. and the fact that you reached out to everybody. And, and everyone was there for you. It'd be so good to know that that's possible. It's so easy to feel alone in your hole, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I really hope that we can do that for each other as well. And I, I don't know how this COVID thing is going to play out. If we all go into lockdown, what's going to happen? But it just feels like we do need to start to create these, um, yeah, these links with each other that we can always be around for each other somehow, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And um, because we need that and to get a perspective on it. You know, I mean, already we were pretty isolated, weren't we? Our yeah. community, we've lost a lot of our community and now even more, yeah. you know, it, we really do need to reach out. And it's almost like that um, instinct to be able to say what's going on for you is, is really hard, isn't it? Because to be able to go not coping very well, I mean, I think as a mother, I think I've definitely changed a lot in the way that I just get on with stuff um, as much as I can, whereas maybe I wouldn't have before. Um, and also, you know, how things have definitely changed, you know, difficult times have definitely, definitely changed me. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really difficult balance, but I do think we don't have enough support. And, you know, it's really interesting about the caring, um, it's not really valued, you know, mm -hmm. it's not being a mother, being a parent, it's not, not really valued in society. So, so, you know, that's really interesting too, because it's a massively important thing that we're doing and um, it's just invisible, it's just not mentioned particularly. So, yeah, um, but then again, as a parent, you meet other parents and you support each other. So, yeah, I just think, we need more than ever to connect with each other. Yeah. I think finding male allies as well that actually believe in what you're doing as yeah. well. Like I've been super, super lucky um, with Andy, for instance, who I absolutely adore, like, because he, he encourage, he really actively wants mm -hmm. um, more women involved in tech because, and, he, and he will do everything to kind of support their learning journey. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, he's and, and that's rare. It's mm -hmm. really rare. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I keep joking that we can bribe him with um, cupcakes and, and pictures of pugs. But I mean, there's, there's a sense in which like, he's like a magician and like a wizard mm. for me. Um, but there are other people like that. And even at HMRC, I'm collaborating with an amazing person called Alistair MacDonald. I'm, I'm shouting him out because I think he should win an award for just being a real collaborator. You know, mm -hmm. and if you ask him, but, and his wife's a, an artist as well. And mm. I think it's that kind of connection to, the, mm. to that sort of more sublime nature of things. Yeah. That you get and a curiosity as and well. And a curiosity. And that's, that is really important. And there are so many vulnerable men as well. But I mean, generally, like, mm. it's just great to be able to, to be with, with women and having those chats about stuff that really don't do affect us uniquely and about the body and so on. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I was, I was going to say some other stuff, but no. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> so just about just... finding those people mm. in the first place, right? Because I think, you know, like, I'm just thinking back to even when I first started doing this stuff and I was just like, where do I even go? And like, how do I even learn about this stuff, let alone speak to people? Because, you know, the, the, the network is so important. 
And I think especially like a lot of networking <laughs> yeah. happens after hours when like lots of people can't necessarily yeah. make that. And the idea of having this free time to go to events and also being able to like talk at events as yeah, well. Like, absolutely. you know, get asked to do a lot of things where it's just like, oh, is there a, a budget for that? And then people just say no. And, and then, you know, there's this, this need to be like, oh, well, that's how people know who I am. And maybe that's how you get funding and find all these things. And then you just feel like, you know, you either don't have the time to do those things or you're just like giving away your time for free mm -hmm. as well. And so I hope that, yeah, we can all stand up for ourselves. Yeah. And I was going to give a shout out to Chris there, who's behind the, uh, the, the tech here, because I think what's been interesting about the fuse box is that he's been this sort of very curious person. And again, in collaboration with the other residents, like working to facilitate our yeah. experimentation. Because mm -hmm. if, if you don't have a person who's in that position of managing a space mm -hmm. with equipment that we then use and we invite people in to use, mm -hmm. it makes it almost impossible. Mm -hmm. You need that collaboration. So like yeah. he's, he's sitting there with a red face right now. <laughs> but, Aww, yeah, very but it's so important it's though. Important. And just being able to be like, um, Chris, I don't understand how this uh, mixed reality uh, green screen works. So. <laughs> it's true. You're like, how do we get <laughs> mixed reality? Yeah, and it's just like someone that is basically yeah. like your tech shaman, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Chris, you're our tech shaman. <laughs> but, uh, but, it's, but it's true though. And I think, you know, especially when you are new and getting into these things, then it's really, really important. And especially with the, how things have changed then. I do hope that people can find those things through online. I think Facebook groups, actually, I'm not a big fan of Facebook, but Facebook groups are really helpful for like finding out what's going on and being up to date. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested in immersive tech and healthcare, I recommend VR Doctors, very good place to learn about all mm -hmm. the things that are going on, but actually have developed sort of lifelong friends that have taught me a lot through that as well. Well, uh, I don't know if we should talk about Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but actually that was something that I did really want to speak about as well. <laughs> what are we going to say about that then? Let's well, I think that it's a really interesting time for technology and ethics and like, you know, we, well, well, we, yeah, we work in this very interdisciplinary mm. field where now we are becoming increasingly reliant on technology like we already were, but now, you know, everyone is working digitally and remotely. So more and more people are coming online, but how do we create, yeah, standards and frameworks for ethics and, and start, you know, really not just like sharing a, a video about it, but actually like actively saying like we, we need this. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the whole Facebook Oculus lockdown feels very, very, very significant because mm -hmm. it's the first time where you're forced to use your absolute real identity. And it's interesting because at school, I mean, you know, you've got kids. The, the school um, advice about, you know, your real name, your real personhood mm. is to, to basically hide it and to say that, that you're more vulnerable then. Mm -hmm. So all of the kind of ideas of uh, protect yourself online by not being yourself that come directly from advice around like mm -hmm. how to protect your, your privacy and not be groomed by, mm. you know, pedophiles or whatever. Suddenly, like, we've got this lock in with this one company that wants your very identity and so on. And... And then we know, you know, if you've watched The Circle or anything like that, the power that companies have. But we in our sector like, are very excited by the, the democratising power of Facebook and the quest mm -hmm. right, to bring us the things that we really want to do to bring more um, experiences to more people. So it's that, it's that very interesting kind of bind where you want it, but you, you're worried that, of what it's going to bring. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested to watch that space now to see what Facebook do, how they handle the backlash or whatever is going to come out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, you know, increasingly there is, there's more and more going on, but it's, it's slow and steady. Uh, there's an interesting organisation called Gamer Safer that are doing some really great work into how to protect uh, young people online mm. um, and how to, for example, split out massive multiplayer online games so that you're playing with people your age, for example, um, and, yeah, can spot when there are problems early on, so they're good to check out. Mm. Uh, and then there's also the XR Safety Initiative uh, that's been developed mm. by really... Um, Incredible woman called uh, Kavya Perlman as well. So I'm in their medical XR council. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she was actually an advisor to Facebook during the Cambridge Analytica scandal and is now looking at, you know, how do we create, you know, safe practices. And um, I think they're really, you know, looking at how to, yeah. to bring people together. So we've got a long way to go. But yeah, it but it's great like that there's... you're out there finding out all these things. I think that I'm yeah. very much removed from that end of things. And I think um, it would be fantastic to bring to be, I don't know, because, you know, time is difficult, isn't it? You try and book in these, like, mm. meetings. 
And also time zones, right? Like Laura, um, who is, is working with us as business development man, she's like this quantum being. She, she lives across time zones. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we joke about it because how can you like wake up at 3 a.m. and go to a meeting in Australia or New you know, mm -hmm. America or something? But she does. And this is her reality. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we're not taught that at school, how to be multi-time zone creatures, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, and how to create boundaries with that right? as well. And how can you be boundaried when your collaborators work in yeah. Yeah, a completely different but place to you? Booking, saying what's important and actually that we need to we need to have these digests of like important people to look out for what other women are significant like how to rewrite history as well and say that you know let's let's reframe things a little bit um yeah so i'm really grateful that you are out there doing this stuff and, uh, i think all you guys are out there it, doing this stuff to, <laughs> to yeah. yeah well and i hope that yeah i think all of you keep doing your amazing things as well because like it's clearly awesome and uh mm -hmm. and what else we were going to say as well but yeah and i think the uh, you know suggestions to people watching i think there has been lots of questions about how do i get started i think you know like just do it anyway like if you are scared just go for it and actually i think there is a lot of funding opportunities out there at the moment and you know yeah, i think so. all of us have deal dealt with countless rejections in the past but i think the trick is to just like keep on refining it, asking your mates to, to read your funding yeah. application. I mean, I'm a real believer that you just look around where you are right now and you normally have, you know, the stepping stone to the next part. Mm -hmm. You just need to look around and think, okay, what do I need now? What's my next step? Don't look at the bigger picture, just one step. You will probably know what it is, you know. I've always wanted to do programming or I've always wanted yeah. to... The internet is amazing. Just do yeah. it yourself, you yeah. know. Yeah. And it's oh. okay if you're shit to, to begin with yeah. as well like everyone was a beginner yeah. at some point and yeah. i think we all like expect ourselves to be yeah. amazing yes, immediately exactly. yeah. and then actually like you look yeah. at the countless hours that people have invested into the things that they're doing and mm. and yeah it's hopefully you'll get there it, as well you have yeah. to be stubborn for sure constantly yeah. yeah. one thing at a time yeah, that's the trouble. It's very hard to do. Yeah, as parents, we're juggling all the time, yeah. aren't we? Yeah, exactly. and, uh, and, and uh, one thing at a time. Paid, paid work, this work. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Context shifting is difficult. I came yeah. from yeah. working all day at HMRC, where we had a government assessment today, so I was listening to this really formal kind of assessment. Shifting into thinking yeah. about this is really hard. It takes a, it's like a good half gears. an hour, an hour yeah. to, to shift gears. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a very different model of thinking. I feel like that as well. With like, I do a lot of planning, and then I kind of, I kind of get so obsessed with planning that I can't actually do the actual thing. So I have to do the making of the content, the planning of this, the planning of that. And it's like, how do you, you know, you have to think. I think actually there's a really good um i don't know if you know abraham hicks it's quite alternative but it's about segments so you have segments in your day oh, okay. so it's a quite nice way of just going i'm doing this segment now yeah. and then i'm it's like a juicy orange and you think about it as <laughs> you know um just oh i've done that and now i'm going to do something different because we do we are multitasking we are doing different things and we need to have a positive yeah. relationship to that mm -hmm. and actually recognize that that's a really big part of working so on segmenting. your own yeah and i think that makes a lot of yeah. sense yeah. yeah and also making some time to look after yourself as well because mm. i think it's so easy to get wrapped yes. up in i've got to do a million things and then, and then you know burn out. yeah yeah and, <laughs> well, and i think that's yeah. interesting it's, having self-respect having self-care self-love self-respect is is difficult actually because we're used mm. to sort of maybe doing things for other yeah. people but it's so it's super important because you can't give anything to anyone unless you're actually all right in yourself mm. yeah but it's difficult to just take care of yourself it is Really yeah. Going, I'm going to do this for me now because yeah. you feel like you're taking away from someone else. Mm. Yeah. Like kids, are you always, you know, I'm doing my Zumba class now. Okay, but like that means Mum's not around for an hour, even if <laughs> I'm playing my video game anyway. It's yeah, so weird. Yeah, yeah. It's like they want you there, but you know, you know, they don't yeah. really want you there. Like right so now, and then yeah. not. Well, yeah, but you have to be on hand, like safety yeah. net. Just yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. You're like I'm buzzing yeah. around, helicopter parent. Boundaries, <laughs> very important. Yeah. I think mm. I might have to leave that as our final note. Oh, mm. um, but yeah, mm. I hope that everyone is looking after themselves at the moment, because I think especially mm. at the moment, it does feel very go, mm. go, go. But yeah. whilst everyone's doing amazing things, yeah, and take a moment to breathe and remember that's okay, because I think it's very easy to put lots of pressure on ourselves as well. I think, I think the trouble is when, when, my, when my work stops, I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. What it is, I don't know how to relax anymore. Mm. <laughs> mm. How we need it? to learn. We'll that. show you. Maybe, 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 maybe has to do a few like how to relax just, course. Yeah. I think even just walking around the block. I think yeah. like taking a break and then reassess. You know, we could do a walking around the block group. You know, let's just <laughs> walk around the block. Have you done that? Today? This is separate to the check-in meeting. Saying, <laughs> yeah, have you done yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, Don't yeah, talk yeah. about that. Yeah. Block. Yeah.
Um, cool. All right. We are running okay. over a little bit, but I feel like we could talk for hours and hours. Yeah. Um, we thank you so much. Yes, Hubs. we'll be in yeah. Mozilla Hubs now after this. Huge thank you to the Fusebox for hosting us and Chris uh, for being our tech shaman as per usual um follow everyone on instagram facebook twitter linkedin all of the things and uh hopefully we'll do this again soon thank you so much Cheers. Thanks. Thanks.